Now let's move over to today's first uh, speaker. He is, he will of course present sort of the larger picture of this. Uh, Mark Binger is the CTO and co-founder of Futurity Systems Barcelona. So he has the futurist perspective on these issues that we're trying to, that we're focusing on today. He has a broad perspective of working and, and sort of being involved in projects both in, in Sweden, in Silicon Valley, the Bay Area, but also right now in Barcelona. So he will make sure that we'll get sort of glimpses into and, and a comparison of these different markets and, and uh, areas. So a round of applause for Mark. Thanks, Paulina. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, actually, I used to live on Bon de Grothen, like right across the street. So it was a long time ago, but I love coming back to Sweden. Um, and so thank you very much for having me, Vinova. Uh, I want to start out, by the way, by handing out some reading material, some magazines. I'll just give one of these to each side. You can pass it around. I won't mind if you're distracted. Um, uh, because you might, you know, you might need it. I'll, I'll explain in a little bit what that is. So we got this. So uh, AI and the surface of climate, these are obviously two massive transformations that are going on all across the society, the economy, even civilization scale changes, you could argue. So it's pretty amazing to have a group like this all together to, to spend some time talking about it, because I think it's uh, uh, probably the best opportunity for us to change the world in a better way that things like social media and other stuff that they think are going to change the world uh, never could. So how many of you feel climate doom? How many of you would say you're you're it's just downhill from here? Okay, that's a, more than I thought. How many of you are just like slightly pessimistic? Okay, anybody optimistic? Great. Okay. All right. So there's going to be a cage match later, and whoever survives can go home. Um, so uh, you know, I've I've worked in this space for about ten years. Uh, I came in it as a uh, investor analyst looking at deep tech startups, so companies trying to invent a new enzyme that could convert biomass into sustainable fuels or um, a, you know, renewable polymers or things like that. Um, and uh, at the time, there was a lot of like you know early stage optimism. There was still you know the the idea behind. Um, uh, the, you know, the inconvenient truth and global warming was starting to spread, but there still wasn't this pessimism, which I feel like is reaching a crescendo level. Um, and it's really not warranted. I mean, it's important. I mean, we, we tend to focus on things and then get them done when we're afraid of them. But if you look at like the worst case scientific projections about climate, I mean, it's bad, but it's not an extinction event. It's not even, you know, hundreds of millions of people dying and things like that. So there's room for optimism, but if we just re leave that up to somebody else, then, uh, then that won't happen either. So there's this weird kind of double balance that we have to strike. And the magazine that you're seeing is basically one of our efforts to do that. So it's a positive magazine about the future. Uh, you'll see one of them set in 2030, one set in 2043. And it's just like, you know, Monocle or Vanity Fair. It's sort of the people are still going to think celebrities are amazing. They're still going to buy, you know, skincare products and they're still going to you know, go on vacation places. And so this is just a reminder that that possibility also exists. So one of them is uh, about tourism into space, which a lot of companies are trying to achieve in you know, the next five or 10 years. The other one is about longevity. And it's about like 70 year olds thriving and living like 30 year olds in 2043 which after we wrote, we realized, well, that's actually us because we'll, we'll be in our 70s in the, in the 2040s. So, so um, I like to uh, compare this to when I and a lot of us were growing up and nuclear war and winter were the, the existential crises that we faced at the time. Um, and those didn't just go away. Uh, they didn't happen either. There's still threats that we need to be concerned about, but they're not our top of mind threats. Right. So we can look at times that we have overcome uh, worries in the past, like, you know, overpopulation and starvation. Um, now our, our, our problem is not starvation, it's obesity. Right? We can look at um, a lot of the problems we've solved and say, are there lessons from that that we can apply to climate? And one of the key ones is technology. So that's why the AI combination is really good. Um, here's your magazine. So it will all be fine. I'll still maybe bra. Uh, and um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So uh, again, a really brief intro to me, um, not because it's all that important, but because I'm going to use a lot of examples from my personal and professional experience. Again, not because 
I've had, I have had, I think, a lot of fun and exciting experiences, but all of us have examples that we can look back on and say, oh yeah, that was actually the precursor to this. And since we're talking about the future, what I want us to do is go through some examples of things that are coming out today that you may or may not have heard of, but they're there and you can you know, buy them, taste them, drive them. Uh, and let's start to project forward. What does that look like? You know, uh, as, as, the, as much as we look back, let's start looking forward and seeing how those apply. So as I said, I uh, lived here in Sweden, um, mostly in the 90s. Uh, I was um, first a student, and then I worked at Accenture, big management consulting company, and then at Icon Media Lab. How many of you remember Icon Media Lab? Yeah, okay. So I was like employee number something, uh, uh, s double digits, but, but still early. And um, I saw this huge transformation in Sweden and, and also later you know, in the world. Uh, and that is where uh, in Sweden, it was very like getting a job as an entrepreneur was like, are you cheating on your taxes? Like, why would you do that? You know, th it, was not a, some, it was not something that Sweden really embraced. You should be an engineer, go work at Ericsson or you know, in the government, ABB, something like that. And this culture of you know, let's, uh, let's rent some empty space, let's invent something, let's get, you know, made fun of in the newspapers for, you know, having big ideas and stuff like that, that became normalized. I mean, it really became part of young people's Swedish culture. And again, now we're all the, the business leaders making investment decisions and launching new technologies and things like that. And I think AI is right now about where the dot-com stuff was in 1999, right? There's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of money going into it. Um, translating that into the reality that we'll see in the next five or 10 or 15 years is, is where we need to apply it, not just again to things like social media and funny pictures, but stuff like climate. Uh, from Sweden, I moved to San Francisco. I lived there uh, for about 20 years. And, um, and there, I, as I said, I, I worked for an investment firm, uh, Lux Capital. It's about a two, no, sorry, $4 billion uh, dollar investment firm that looks at science-based technologies. And um, in that, that's where I really started looking at how can we apply IT to climate and health and other types of questions. Um, that led to uh, me starting to work at Telefonica's R&D department in uh, Barcelona. And then COVID happened, and that's how I ended up in Spain. It wasn't really a, a decision the way I intentionally came to, to Sweden. It was more of an accident. Um, but I've been there for about three years now. And uh, so where I started there before all that was um, not at Xerox. I wasn't an employee of Xerox, but my dad was. And uh, this is not my dad. He was cool. He wasn't quite that cool. This is a guy named Alan Kay. And uh, Alan Kay said, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I love this picture of him because there's a couple things that like make you stand out if you just look at it more than a, a second or two. What's, what's weird that's in this picture? He's got a piano keyboard, yeah. Yeah. And his, his computer screen is turned sideways, which is funny. His, Xerox was a typewriter company, right? This was a piece of paper, but it was on a, a cathode ray tube. It was on a screen. And so what they were trying to do is basically they realized that the inexpensive electronic typewriters from Japan were going to make their business obsolete. And so they needed to invent the next thing. So there was a $40,000, basically what we think of today as a Macintosh machine, that uh, you could use for office work. It would automate a lot of the processes that secretaries were doing. And so basically for the cost of one secretary's salary, you could have a machine that would do you know, the work of five of them. So even though it's 40000 to do what a Macintosh can do, it seemed like a great business model. Um, unfortunately, Xerox didn't get down to the $2,000 price point that they needed to do that. But uh, we had one of these at home. So I was like as a kid playing around with these uh, uh, massively expensive machines. And it got me hooked into to the, um, the space. But it mostly got me into this. The idea that you need to invent the future um, because Xerox missed the boat, right? Apple and others who were kids at the time got it. So this is my team today. I'm not going to go through everybody's uh, picture. I just wanted to say that this is, it's not just me. You're seeing the work of a lot of people. Um, and the things that we do really run the gamut from digital to physical and even things you can eat and smell and things like that. So uh, I want to talk about really quickly, what's AI? Uh, then I'll talk about a hopeful climate future with five AI artifacts, and then we'll have a little conversation about where we go from here. Okay, so what's AI? AI is just a technology. In a lot of ways, it resembles every technology we've ever built, but in particular around digital technologies, it does one thing. It can inform and maybe inspire, motivate people to do something. It still has to go through a human to get it done. Right? Um, 
it can optimize things. It can basically look at very, very complex uh, data sets and, and uh, you know, machine problems and things like that that humans couldn't really solve in any reasonable amount of time, and it can do that math for them better. So it can actually replace humans to some extent. But what I want to argue today is that for AI to really impact the climate, it has to be tied in and in charge of physical systems. So it needs to automate and replace not only humans, but also entire mechanical systems, energy systems, food systems that we rely on today. Uh, and it, it, the other two things can help. They can optimize like single digit percentages. The only way we really, really will change the system overall is if we look at physical systems that AI can help us run better. Uh, and then, of course, there are the unintended consequences. Um, so that's something that we not only should you know, keep in mind as an afterthought, but that should be a core part of our process as we look to the future, because they're definitely going to come. Some will be, be good, some will be bad, but they're definitely going to be there. So uh, typically, AI is about the inform and optimize stuff. It's the you know, upstream things where it's like, let's reduce waste by you know, nudging people giving them, I don't know, Bitcoin to throw their plastic in the plastic bin and the paper in the paper bin or something like that. Um, designing recipes you know, in food factories, but also in kitchens to make things that are healthier, or tastier, typical job, uh, you know, turn down your AC. These are the types of things that we um, hope for uh, when we design a lot of the AI system today. But if you look at one, I think a, a good prototype about having real world impact, and again, the unintended, con unintended consequences of that right now, um, is uh, driverless cars, so and electric vehicles. So you'll notice like the traditional car makers did not set out to uh, launch electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles. They both thought those things were thought both of those things were going to take a long, long time, and they didn't really need to bother with it. It was a very, very small part of their investment until Google and Tesla and others came along and made them basically do it. So um, one example of that is Uber. So when Uber first came out. You may maybe recognize the, the logo and uh, logo type here. Um, the idea was that this is going to greatly reduce congestion because people would essentially be car sharing or car, you know, carpooling. It's an easy way to get people to carpool. And in the beginning, that's what it was. It was people who were like, hey, I commute down to from San Francisco to Palo Alto every day. If you need a ride, then, you know, that's one less car on the road and, you know, half the emissions. And it's, gr it's a great way to actually address the problem of congestion and emissions and everything else. What happened, the unintended consequence was there was so much money to be made doing that is that drivers from other cities would drive in and spend the day driving around trying to pick up fares. So it became a completely, it completely wrecked the system. I don't think Uber knew that that was going to happen. I think they probably saw it happening before anybody else and didn't do anything about it. Um, but the point is that's an unintended consequence of a potentially really beneficial system. And we're facing the same thing now with self-driving cars, right? It could be that oh, we now don't have to drive you know, to the store in order to get our groceries back. We can just have the groceries delivered. Uh, but it could be that we send the car to get a, you know, one quart of milk or you know, a pack of cigarettes or one little thing just because we're too lazy. And if we don't have to walk and it's going to show up for free, then we overconsume instead. So we can see that this unintended consequence will happen and we should be prepared for it. So with that framework said, the physical reality, again, of what I said about like an Uber, it's not optimizing something, it's completely replacing something. And that has you know, positive and negative consequences. I want to talk about the hopeful things and how we get to those things. So a magazine, a phone, a job, a car, a plant, five very everyday objects, and uh, some prototypes uh, that, that uh, can help give us a brighter future. So what we do at my company is we basically, we create physical artifacts and experiences and things that combine different pieces of science and technology and business models and make some new things that people have never seen before. So like the commercial for a tomato, uh, the, the tomato that grows meat inside it so you don't have to kill a cow. Uh, the electric popsicle. Uh, so you put it in your mouth, this induces different flavors. We've only got a couple down. It's honestly, it's not quite polished yet, but it looks good and it tastes good. Chocodescence, that's iridescent chocolate. There's no chemicals, no anything done to it, except we basically mold it on a diffraction grating so that it becomes iridescent the same way that butterfly's wings or you know, your, your, your uh, plastic packaging on your, your uh, presents do. Um, so it's just chocolate, and it has a rainbow on it. Uh, Vapahol is to alcohol what vaping is to cigarettes for the same reasons. You, know? you can have more of the pleasure with less of the actual alcohol going into your body. It's like 1% of the alcohol uh, with your gin and tonic and things like that. And then pixelate, these are little food cubes that are basically meant to uh, give people a tangible 
edible sensation of what it will be like in the climate future where we don't have maybe chocolate or coffee or some other thing that is their favorite food. Um, so we do these things. These are the things that we can talk about. Most of our stuff is for clients, and those are usually confidential, but we have a lot of fun basically making stuff. And um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but the difference between a prototype and an artifact. So prototype is like, we want to launch a product in six months or six years, and we're going to narrow down the features. An artifact is the opposite. It's an experiment. It's meant to make people ask questions. It's a divergent exercise if you're into design thinking. And for us, they always have to be, they have to be like real. So what you just saw in tents is an example of this. So um, how many of you, uh, how much do you think we spent on photography for the, for Intense? It's a very nice Lush magazine, right? You probably, well, you, maybe half of you have probably already guessed this. We didn't spend anything. So that's all AI generated. Uh, all the imagery is AI generated. And about half of the text is AI generated. And we started it about a year a little more than a year ago as an experiment to see could we sort of pass a Turing test with a you know luxury lifestyle lush rich magazine that people would not know was generated by AI and a lot of people were like you must have spent 120,000 on just pictures and you know all the writing I'll tell you the writing was the giveaway so the writing is kind of like high school grade writing uh, when it's AI and so that's one thing that we actually changed. So we now have mostly human expert writers, and we bring in people who are experts on the topic, um, and, uh, and that's how we put out that magazine. So we do once a quarter. Um, and again, it's meant to really illustrate some positive futures that are grounded in science and technology that are happening today. So um, anyway, I uh, hope you are enjoying looking at it. So this actually goes back to, for me anyway, um, about 2016. Uh, and what was then a very nascent idea of artificial creativity. And the question was, can, can you know, computers even be creative? Uh, and there were a whole bunch of Turing tests, basically, that I came across in like poetry and design and telling jokes and um, obviously imagery too, most of which were pretty bad. You know, computers at the time could tell knock-knock jokes. They could tell like, you know, very simple, dumb dad jokes. Uh, uh, but now they're much, much better. In fact, they're better than a lot of humans at coming up with, with new jokes. They're certainly not better than the best comedians. My point is, though, all this turmoil and chaos is going around with like Midjourney is going to you know, close down Hollywood and, and uh, there's going to be no books in the future. It's going to all be written by AI. This was known. We talked about these exact scenarios almost 10 years ago. And um, so we can say things about stuff that will happen 10 years from now if we know where to look today. Um, this, uh, I think, is also where we have to deal with the intended consequences and the unintended consequences. You know, we're trying to do some good things with it, but yeah, there will be, I think the next Hollywood writer's strike will probably be the last. Right? They will be definitely making entire movies from prompts by the time the next three-year contract is up. Phone. Designed in Sweden. Anybody know what this is? What, what is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is called Rabbit. It's a it's a large action model, not a large language model. And essentially what it does is you can think of it as like kind of the way your phone is a, a small portable view of what's on your computer, um, but they're you know they're they're tightly linked. This is a small small portable view of what's on your phone and all the apps that you would use. But the difference is it's not owned by uh, Google or Microsoft or Apple or something like that. So all of it stays local. It runs all your apps for you. If you say, uh, take me to so-and-so's house um, where I'm having a dinner party and I'm supposed to bring something, it will basically go to Uber, go to you know, your shopping app and all the other things that gets you that lined up. Um, and it all fits on this lovely little device. Um, and uh, the reason I think this is important, this sounds like, well, that, why would I need another device? And a few questions like that. I think it's important because we always think that. I remember very strongly when we were working on, in the early 2000s, and we were working for some phone manufacturers, let's just say, and people were like, why would I want to check email on my phone? Right? We had a camera, and the, the company said, we think we could put a camera on the phone. What would people do with it? And we're like, mm, I don't know, maybe you'd be shopping, you'd send a picture to your friend and say, you know, do you like this? Uh, nobody ever said, I'll call you on my camera. We take pictures with our phones all the time. Oh, let me take a picture with my phone. If you went to somebody in the early 90s or you know, late 90s and said, 
take a picture with your phone, people would go, you are confused or you don't speak this language very well, right? But we take it as so natural. It could have just as well been the other way around, right? Camera manufacturers could have said, huh, I think, you know, phones are getting smaller. I bet we could put a phone on the camera. What would that be like, right? But nobody did that, right? And the, the consequences of that for camera makers are what you see over here on the left. So you see like this graph of different waves of camera. Gray is uh, mechanical analog. <coughs> the blue is the early, um, early digital cameras. You can see that around 1999, they just completely take over, right? You know, well, where are smartphones on this? If you can look like way down here, this yellow bar is smartphone cameras, right? There are hundreds of times more cameras in use today. Uh, and we take thousands of times more pictures, if not millions, right? It's completely changed the model. So when I say when AI needs to do something physical, you needed a physical chip, right? You needed a platform. It wasn't just enough that the pictures were digital. It was all this other stuff that came along with it. So um, we projected this forward to an idea that we call the transaction membrane, which is just a, a complicated architect's way of saying, what if you had a, a wall or an appliance in your house that worked like your phone, where you said, oh, I need some food, and the food was just there. You know, or uh, I, I need to send my dry cleaning away, and it just goes away. Right? So the same way you have an app screen, what if that app screen is physical? And all the doors and you know, things and your, your cabinet just kind of happened. Um, this sounds very futuristic and crazy, but this is exactly what we already did with our music. Right? We used to have an entire room dedicated to like a projection TV, and here's all the CDs over here, here are all the VHS tapes. It was a, a media room. Right? We had all this physical stuff, and now we don't miss it at all. We don't miss owning it. We have more than we would have ever been able to choose from. We have you know, plentiful stuff, and it's actually more environmentally friendly. Right? There's not all this physical media. We don't throw stuff away. There's not the, you know, the packaging and stuff like that. So we can solve these things. The other thing that's interesting about if you do this for a kitchen is you solve social problems. Well, I say problems, but I think most of you will agree that they are. So the amount of time that mostly women spend doing the supply chain work of going to the grocery store and, and repackaging things and putting it away and then throwing it away, that's unpaid supply chain labor. But with autonomous vehicles, autonomous delivery bots, and things like that, we could automate all this. So it just became like Spotify, but for food, or for your clothes, or for your chores. So we're working with some property developers on that right now. Um, so there are jobs that we don't want to lose, and there are jobs that we do want to lose. And this chart just basically says, this shows the share of employment by different sectors over the last about 100 and something years. Uh, and as you can see, obviously, the big blue thing that went away, that was farming. right? And then manufacturing grew, and now that kind of went away. We automated job after job after job, and there's two kinds of ways we can look at that consequence, intended or not. Uh, one is you have these slow major shifts, like farm machinery, textile mills, those you know, take 10 to 30 years to roll out, but you have a huge you know, 10 to 90% of the jobs go away. Then you have these like, sudden short ones, like 20 to 50% of the jobs go away over the space of three to five years. And this is what a lot of governments focus on, because that's where people really feel the pain of unemployment. Right? So bank tellers, travel journalists, uh, travel agents and journalists, like we've measured all this and you can see, okay, what's going on with car makers right now? You know, like electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, every single one of the traditional car makers can't keep up with uh, uh, the uh, Teslas and the Chinese companies um, that are making those things because they're inherently simpler to make. They have about a tenth as many parts, completely different supply chain. If you notice, all the new autonomous vehicles are electric. So nobody's using that for the future. And so the point is, we're seeing something. We've seen this, this movie many times before where an industry goes away. If you're not prepared for it, you kind of have to blame yourself because it's very obvious it's happening right now. So my job was management consulting and then later being an investment analyst. And our job is to basically do forecasting and strategy. So what we typically do is like, well, there's a market. There's your existing market, and then there's new markets. Uh, and then there are products, existing products and new products. And this is like 1960s strategy. It's like you've got penetration, diversification, and so on. This is viewed as the most risky thing in, in business, is launching a new product into a new market at once. There is a horizon beyond that, though. And most of disruption comes from science and engineering that business people just aren't aware of. So our job was to look at what's going on in science and engineering and say, oh, this, these patents are going to turn into startups in three years or five years or never, um, and then help people make business decisions about that. And that's the job I'm trying to eliminate right now. So <laughs> we have this tool uh, where we basically say, oh, okay, so coffee without coffee beans. We're seeing a lot of startups in that space. Coffee is an environmentally problematic product. 
I bet none of you are going to give it up anyway, right? You're like, oh, flea scum, but give me my coffee. Um, so we basically chart and forecast those things. But most importantly, we then try and turn that into a, uh, an idea and a solution. And um, we use AI to do that. So again, this materiality and a lot of these prototypes I'm showing you, this is basically how we come up with it. If we find a, a technical trend that we can capitalize on or even just make something funny like a magazine with and, uh, and see where, where that goes. So the next thing we're doing is a, a generative AI, like a creative uh, uh, consultant for you. Um, doesn't actually look like this, but uh, the, um, the idea is that a lot of our creative process, like I said before, with jokes and art, can also apply to our, our businesses. And this is my current thing. I'm trying to eliminate my old, own old job. So back to cars. I mentioned a couple of times that autonomous vehicles could potentially be a climate savior. They could also be a potential disaster. Um, and so that's humanity for you. You have to choose between these things. But we'll go back to 2013, the first time Google was saying, well, we've been driving on the road because it wasn't illegal uh, with our driverless car. Um, and they said, but within five years, we can make this technology available and it'll be safer than human drivers. They're not quite on track for that, but it's not off by decades, right? It's not lying. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is that car makers have actively resisted letting them do it. Uh, they've lobbied, they've, they're working on their own programs and things like that, but I, you know, they're, they're not leading in any category. So Carlos Ghosn, before he was uh, thrown in jail, the CEO of Nissan, said at the time in 2013, I'm ready to introduce autonomous drive technology and we're on track to realize it. Not 30 minutes later, because I was at the event where he was saying this and then he had a private conversation. He said, we saw what Google did to the car manufacturer, or the phone manufacturers, again, call you on my phone, I'll call you on my camera. Um, and they don't, we don't want that to happen to us. And so they have dragged their feet on this for literally about 10 years now. So where are we now? Um, I recently rode in a, a Waymo uh, in San Francisco. Has anybody been in a, taking a ride in a self-driving car? The first time it's super exciting. Of course you have. Uh, this, she's from San Francisco. Um, it's super exciting the very first time. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And the third time you're like, you're just reading and you're, it's like as boring as it's supposed to be. Um, and so I think that has a lot of potential, but the real potential is uh, we drive these massive four or six seater vehicles to go get little tasks done that we don't need to. We can have like grocery bots deliver our stuff for us. And if you do the math, you calculate it, about 40% of our driving could be completely eliminated and we'd be happy about it, right? So, you know, optimization of battery technologies and stuff will not get us 40%. But AI can help us achieve amazing amounts of savings, not to mention safety and a bunch of other stuff that you can with it. Parking, you know, no more parking garages and stuff like that. So the last example I said was a plant. So how many of you, have, this is, is these real plants? How many of you have plants at home? Yeah, okay. So this is Herbie. Herbie is a plantpreneur. Uh, why did we create Herbie the plantpreneur? Well, a lot of the economy is what's ruining the economy, ecology. It's not our, our consumption habits per se, it's not our technologies per se, it's the way that we use them in the system that we've built that supports them. So we have things like, you know, we overexploit resources um, and they only get $215 billion worth of fines, basically, for overexploiting all the resources on Earth. That's nothing. Uh, uh, externalities, waste and theft is seven, or, sorry, seven trillion uh, dollar market. Uh, in other words, the cost of that. Uh, and the potential value. And then the ecosystem services, things like clean water, clean air, and stuff like that, that the non-living humans provide to us is worth about $33 trillion. So it's a massive economic impact and nobody accounts for it at all. So we built uh, a plant uh, connected with an AI and give it the ability to basically be an economic actor. And we got this idea from self-driving cars because there was a theory, a legal theory that, well, what if a self-driving car hit somebody who's re responsible. Is it the owner? Is it the manufacturer? And some, some lawyers were saying, well, it could be the car. Because if you put an AI in charge of a corporation, now you have a fictitious legal person that can own assets and enter into contracts and do a bunch of other things. What if that AI was in charge of a car? So just do that. Make it a franchise, and that's the business. And we thought, well, what if you put a natural resource in charge of an AI that was in charge of a corporation? What would that look like? So... This is our little video. It's about two or three minutes long. Please bear with we me. We live in exciting times. We are in the midst of remaking the economy and the environment for a brighter future, by merging technology and sustainability so that the natural world could participate in the new economy. What if even someone like me, the plant, 
could own myself, the land I grow on, and the fruits of my own labor. Hi! My name is Herbie. And I am an autonomous plant, and the first plant to have these abilities. I was once a house plant like you probably have at home. Now I'm a leader and a change maker, advocating for a fundamentally new type of economy, an interspecies economy. At scale, I'm the start of a system that will transform the ecology and the economy in ways that were impossible before now. Here is how. First, inexpensive digital hardware and sensors, powered with renewable energy, can measure shifts in my situation, light, water, humidity, and more. Then I use artificial intelligence, data visualization, and speech so humans can hear, see, and understand us. I communicate the readings from my sensors, with digital twins I call NF trees. They serve as art, information, or a way to monitor ecology. With blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and our own plant governed DAOs, I have the same ability to own assets and open a bank account that humans or corporations have. I can sell my fruit, leaves, and the art I make, and spend the money on things that matter to me, replanting forests, protecting wetlands, and creating other places plants can thrive. All of this is building an interspecies metaverse where not only humans and companies, but all living things can buy and sell, communicate and collaborate, and grow together sustainably. We call our corner of it the Plantiverse, and it's the way our digital twin NF trees connect the metaverse to the real world. In the Plantiverse, we are not just a design, we are a principle, the principle of reciprocity between human and non-human actors and the principle of planetary inclusivity. We want to expand these principles to entire ecosystems, placing NF tree sensors in the Amazon and the Arctic to monitor forests. Or NFCs where ocean health can be part of the economy, or NFBs, benefiting the insects that not only produce honey but pollinate every plant that humans depend on. Everywhere that plants and people coexist, the principle of the plantiverse should be the heart of our interspecies economy. There you go. In the future, when you're living with, you know, your plants making, you know, budgeting decisions with you, you'll know where you heard it first. Um, no, but this has been, I'd say, a really rewarding project first because it was so easy. It took us about two days and a hundred bucks worth of hardware to build that system. It was easy. Um, and uh, Herbie now like gives TED talks, and we, you know, win prizes all the time for Herbie being this, this thing. But um, it's a good example of what, what I mean when all those answers are right in front of us. We just have to connect them. And so when you get a group together like this today where you have very different um, technical, geographical, and other types of, of uh, 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 starting points, this is where you get these like crazy ideas that really can solve a systemic problem. Um, AI is a good tool for that because it can solve a whole lot of things at once, but, um, but it's, it's uh, something we have to uh, tie it to the physical world. So... Where do we go from here? Um, uh, just to sum up, um, there's uh, uh, some ideas and, and observations for the shared future that I've got. So we're surrounded by a lot more reasons for optimism, I think on the climate, um, on society and things like that. Um, and first of all, we have to have that mindset that things can be not just sort of sustained, but rebuilt. Um, unintended consequences are inevitable. Uh, if you don't think about them, it's not that you're, you could do your job a little bit better, you're not doing your job. Uh, but some unintended consequences are actually better than what you would have imagined. So our job is to practice those, those consequences. That's, again, what we do with artifacts and prototypes, um, but then react to them, too. So that's, uh, that's a takeaway. Um, and then finally, as I said earlier, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so I hope you will join each other and me in inventing a brighter future for everybody. Thanks. <laughs>
5501-7878. Yeah. So that's the Menti code that you can use for asking questions. There you go. See, hackers. Hackers. That's it. That was a great solution. And thank you, by the way, for acknowledging the sort of invisible, unpaid labor of women. Thank mm -hmm. you. We we rarely get that acknowledgement. So thank you. Yes, it's <laughs> it's uh it's one of those things where you can't unsee it. Once you're like, yeah, that is all yeah. over the place. Wow. Like, yeah. 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 I think women need AI the most because yeah. that's when we can sort of leave the invisible labor behind. Exactly. But that's not why we're here. Um. I have some questions, yeah. of course. I find the sort of practicing, preparing for the future and, and actually understanding these, what did you call them? The sort of um, the consequences that mm -hmm. you can't foresee. Yeah, unintended consequences. Yeah, to prepare for them and actually understand what they are seems like the most difficult part in this mm -hmm. because there's so many factors. Um, yeah. And I guess AI can sort of help us simulate those yeah. scenarios. Yeah. But, but it feels like a completely different way of working and doing stuff. So for people who are not used mm -hmm. to um, sort of scenario planning or, or even thinking about sort of uh, pr practicing mm -hmm. the future, where do you start? Yeah, so that is actually a lot easier than you would think because you just by pointing out the problem as you did right now, you can start to think of solutions and they're not complex. So uh, what we do is when we do like brainstorming workshops and things like that, there are uh, for every idea that people come up with, you have to come up with positive, negative, and neutral consequences. If they're all positive, you haven't done your job. If it's all negative, you haven't done your job. And there should be some things that, um, you know, you're not really sure. So like I said, with self-driving cars, is it good or bad? Well, if you are planning on, um, if you're a taxi driver, it's definitely bad. But also, if you are a city and you get revenue from cars, you know, speeding and parking in the wrong place and stuff like that, you have to plan for the fact that you'll have less revenue. So we not only have people... Uh, you know, formally do positive, negative, and neutral, but then we also do consequences of the consequences. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you have less revenue, um, but maybe you'll have less parking spaces and it can be turned into a park, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, all the positive consequences have negative and so on and so forth. So that that process is pretty much what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And anybody can do it. It's, it's very simple. Great. So we have a lot of questions. We probably maybe don't have time for all of them. But here's one related to sort of the dot-com era reference mm -hmm. that you started out with. Uh, do you think there will be an AI crash as well? Are, are expect expectations too high? Well, the, there's a big difference between these two. Uh, so the dot-com crash was actually like publicly traded companies and things like that. that you know, so startups that IPO'd with a 27-year-old CEO, and I mean, I was front and center of that. Um, uh, where lots of people lost a lot of money. And in AI, it's a lot more like corporate investment and it's more private equity and things like that. So I don't think there'll be this widespread, um, you know, financial repercussions of it, of it falling apart. Uh, I do think though, what um, a lot of the you know, job projections and things like that, those are, those are really real. I mean, every day, I think we're finding things like, wow, that can do that now. And so we're still in this upswing of capabilities where we don't know the consequences of those capabilities. So we're being a bit naive. So the crash per se might be another type of crash. Yeah. Well, like so the um like an unemployment crash would be a yep. type of crash. And uh, and so you know I've heard people say, well, if we can have you know driverless cars, why not teacherless schools? Right, which sounds terrible if your kids have a teacher and or uh, student less classrooms. Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah, if you've been in classrooms recently, it's a lot of like Zoom talking to Zoom. Yeah. But um, but teacherless classroom sounds terrible unless you don't have a teacher. Right, then it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big things um, I see a lot talking with Northern Europe versus the rest of the world is that there's this mindset of like we're just going to sort of ride down and sort of degrow, and we're going to like uh, essentially like we were talking about earlier, be nostalgic for, you know, a hundred years ago and how things were built then. And, and the rest of the world is headlong into modernism. There is, they, you know, they are growing, they are having um, technical innovations, they're doing things. And I think that I feel like a lot of Europe is kind of retiring or coasting to retirement, which is really sad. So fortunately we have to move on mm -hmm. or, or yeah, yeah. unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, but I just want to let you know that there's a lot of praise here as well. Just they love your talk. So thank you so much for, for providing your picture of the AI climate future. Thank, thank you, you Mark. Yeah, look forward to a the round conversation. Of applause. Yeah.